this is a catch-up session so that we can add audio to a lecture for which it didn't work on Monday. Sorry about that. And uh, we'll go through it reasonably quickly. So what I wanted to talk about was some of the remediation techniques that I haven't talked about already, and they are actually some of the more simple techniques, adding things to soil to change the chemical form, usually, of contaminants, and how well, in general, some of the soil remediation techniques we've talked about in the last few sessions work. And then, finally, spending a little bit of time looking at uh, possible techniques for remediation of groundwater. Groundwater is not really the focus of this unit, but it has turned out to be quite an issue at the Centenary Park site, so we'll cover briefly some of the techniques there. Okay, so in terms of remediation with amendments, basically the idea is to add something to a contaminated material, soil or uh, deeper material, uh, which changes the chemistry a bit. So for example, one of the common ones to deal with metals would be lime. Liming raises the pH of the soil and that favours precipitation of many of the trace elements as carbonates or hydroxides or whatever, uh, or uh, increases the absorption of many of the cationic trace elements, so elements like copper, zinc, lead, cadmium and so forth. Uh, the situation is a little bit different for elements like arsenic. Similarly, phosphate is used to amend soils within contaminated environments, particularly where the contaminant is lead, because many lead minerals are quite, in lead phosphate minerals are quite insoluble. For example, the lead phosphate mineral pyrophyllite. Uh, sometimes we use organic materials, like composts or uh, other organic amendments. In some cases, organic amendments, like sewage sludges, of course, or some animal effluents, can actually add contaminants to the system, so we need to be careful about the composition of organic materials because they're often quite uncontrolled. Biochar is a specific example of an organic material usually created from oxygen deficient combustion of some waste material, uh, food waste or uh, animal waste or um, a crop residue or something like that and it creates a material similar to activated charcoal. It can absorb both organic and inorganic contaminants, so pesticides, metals, hydrocarbons, and so on. The second major category of fairly simple methods to deal with contaminated soils is simply to cover them. And the idea here is if we cover them deep enough, certainly we reduce surface transport phenomena like contaminated material blowing around uh, in the air or being transported by surface erosion and also th with sufficient depth of clean fill we uh, keep plant roots away from the contaminated material and that's particularly the case if we insert something between the clean material and the contaminated material like a geotextile or a clay cap and uh, a clay cap being quite impermeable com compared with the permeable geotextile clay caps also may exclude some water or, or oxygen and that may be a good thing uh, depending on what is in the contaminated material. So if it's uh, a potentially acid producing material then oxygen exclusion is usually a good idea. So here's an example of the effect of lime. So what we have here is the uptake of cadmium by in this case a, a mixture of ryegrass and clover, a typical pasture sward. So we're really using plant uptake is a direct indicator of bioavailability of cadmium in this case and the context was rehabilitation of mineral sands mine wastes using biosolids so biosolids being the polite term for sewage sludge uh, which has been stabilized by addition of lime as well uh, biosolids is of some concern sometimes because it can contain uh, concentrations of trace elements that can be harmful and we see some of that effect in these results so if we look at the horizontal axis it's showing different rates of biosolids application and what we see is when we increase the amount of biosolids applied to the particular materials then we see an increase in concentration in the different plant components um, ryegrass root and shoot separated clover root and shoot separated as well all right but 
um, looking at the difference between the top row and the bottom row of graphs, so that's unlimed compared with limed, we see that liming decreases the concentration of cadmium in the plant parts, and by implication, it, liming has decreased bioavailability. Okay. So this was uh, actually done in Western Australia. There's a bit of shameless self-promotion, if you note who the author was there. And um, I'll come back to this a little bit later on when we talk about uh, use of soil covers and, and just amending things with topsoil and things. Okay. The other thing we mentioned was phosphorus. So here's a slightly different example where the endpoint is not uptake by plants as a measure of bioavailability, but actually the blood concentrations of lead um, as a function of different application rates of phosphorus to the soil. So we're taking it right through, in this case, to uh, the animal receptors of contamination. And there's one study on humans, the other are on pigs and rats. But what we see is that the numbers here are all less than one and the numbers is our effect ratio, which means uh, that concentration in uh, related to in blood related to treated soil, so treated with phosphate, compared with untreated, which is our control. And so if the treatment works, then these ratios should all be less than one, which they are. So in terms of having a final outcome, it seems as though in this quite complex study by Shackle and co-workers, that phosphate treatment of soil was sufficient to reduce the incidence of uh, lead toxicity in the blood of different mammal species, including humans. So that's a good thing. That seems to work as well. And there's lots of, lots of literature on this, so I, we can't cover it all today. Biochar, as I mentioned, is a uh, an organic charred material, so it's somewhere between natural soil charcoal and activated carbon in terms of its reactivity. The properties of it are generally that it exists in fine grain sizes and also has some sort of surface reactivity, including electrostatic charge, but also the ability to adsorb even non-polar organic pollutants. So it's quite a reactive material. Uh, and there have been a number of studies shown, you can look at this review here, showing that it does reduce the concentration of a number of contaminants in soils by an adsorption mechanism. The flip side of this is it may reduce herbicide effectiveness. Of course, m most herbicides are organic compounds, which may become pollutants, but in land rehabilitation, we may also want to control weeds. Uh, and so, uh, particularly for what we call pre-emergent herbicides, which are added to the soil to try and stop weed seedlings coming up in the first place, the effectiveness may be reduced if there is biochar in the soils to adsorb some of the herbicide before it has a chance to work on the weeds themselves. Ahmed et al. provided another review of adsorption of different types of contaminants by biochars and uh, by and large they seem to be successfully able to adsorb at least in laboratory studies many contaminants including triazine herbicides um, and the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and this is an excerpt from a very large table and there's much more data in there the the properties of the biochar are quite variable in fact, um, they depend on the, the type of waste material used. So there's a, a range that you can see here from animal manures to green waste to sewage sludge and, and hardwoods. And different combustion temperatures make a difference as well. So you need to know what you're getting in terms of applying biochar to soils to reduce contaminant bioavailability. So phytoremediation, which is relying on plant uptake to hopefully reduce the concentrations mainly of metal contaminants in soils uh, does have its theoretical limits and that's related to the partitioning of elements between the plant and the soil. So we saw this graph the other day uh, just to revise a few things. So cadmium um, is an element where plants are able to take up a lot relative to its concentration in soil. So it has a high index of bioaccumulation or a high ratio of the element concentration in the plant to the element concentration in the soil. So cadmium is a good candidate for remediation using plants or phytoremediation. 
whereas some elements down the bottom end of the scale, nickel and chromium, where we'd expect much lower concentrations in the plant than in the soil, that phytoremediation would not be expected to be so successful with those. This issue was taken up by a review on phytoremediation by uh, McGrath and Zhao. It's a little bit old, but they make a good point. Um, and the point is summarised in this graph here, where uh, they take account of plant biomass and the, the bioconcentration factor, which is pretty much the same as this index of bioaccumulation. So if we have a bioconcentration of 40, which may be achieved for some plant species for elements like cadmium or zinc, uh, depending on the plant and also depending on the soil, and we achieve a, a realistic plant biomass, let's say uh, a you know, good yield might be 10 tonnes of dry matter per hectare, then it will take, according to this uh, conceptual model, about three or four crops to reduce the concentration of a particular element in the soil by half. Now that's with a high bioconcentration factor and a good plant yield. Let's go to the other extreme where the bioconcentration factor is 1. We know that for some elements it may be well less than 1, or maybe 0.1 or 0.01, um, in which case we wouldn't bother at all, I don't think. But let's take the same plant yield, bioconcentration of factor of 1, uh, and a yield of 10 tonnes per hectare. We're looking at about two or 300 crops before we reduce a metal concentration in soil by half, and that's probably uneconomic. So there's some things to think about, that phytoremediation really may only be effective up this end of the scale. But it does depend on plant species and so on. If you remember the previous slide, you'll note that elements like lead actually have, in general, quite a low uh, plant uptake index. In that diagram it was less than one, but in some cases, depending on the plant species it's used, we can successfully phytoremediate lead, and here's a, a case study from the USA um, where the information is presented uh, primarily in quite an unusual way, but the phytoremediation was done using brassica junkia or Indian mustard, so it's a plant species somewhat resembling canola. Um, so I guess one of the main results is this one here, that uh, after three harvests, which was done in the first year, the mean lead concentration in the soil decreased by about half from just over 2,000 milligrams per kilogram, which in, in most instances would be above at least ecological protection limits, down to 960, which is still high, but it shows that the phytoremediation is working. And this other way of looking at the data is to show what percentage of land area has concentrations above a certain threshold. So at the beginning of this experiment, 24% uh, of the land area had lead concentrations above 1,700 milligrams per kilogram. After the third harvest, so that's after one year of phytoremediation, only six. So that's been uh, divided by four. Uh, and similar results for most of the other concentration thresholds. So a lot of the area had concentrations greater than 600 milligrams per kilogram. And in fact, at the beginning, all of it did. Uh, and so we've removed about 13% of the land area from having uh, a 600 milligram per kilogram concentration of lead. So in this instance, it did seem to work reasonably well. Um, and the, the authors of that article do provide other examples as well. Now, um, that's a, a s example of successful phytoremediation of lead. Now we expect phytoremediation for an element like cadmium to be more successful even because of its high bioaccumulation index. But here's an example casting a little bit of doubt on that. It's not a completely unsuccessful example. But here's the plant species here, Flaspy carolescens, which is kind of famous in phytoremediation circles because of its ability to take up quite high concentrations of elements like cadmium. It's one of the few cadmium hyperaccumulators that's known to science. Uh, but it's a scrawny little plant um, and uh, has relatively low yields. And to add to that complication, the data that I'm showing at top left here, with the, the names at the top refer to different varieties or different collection locations of the 
Thlaspy plants um, show different, quite different behaviour. It's in the same experiments, so the same range of soil cadmium concentrations, but a much different response in terms of plant cadmium uptake. Uh, in this case, expressed in grams of cadmium per hectare. All right. So, while one particular cultivar or um, genotype of Thlaspy uh, is taking up a maximum of about 60 to 70 um, grams per hectare of cadmium, um, another genotype collected from a different place was able to take up maybe four times that. Uh, given the same soil cadmium concentrations. The soil is exactly the same uh, in both instances. It is an example of uh, multiple metal contamination. So again, I, I think phytoremediation as a technique maybe, or at least was at this stage in uh, 2000, uh, a technique in its infancy. And that there aren't many uh, applications of phytoremediation which have worked in a real life situation. Okay, what we haven't talked about up until now in this session is bioremediation of organic contaminants. And one of the ways this can occur is because the organic contaminants are by definition carbon compounds, they should be able to be metabolised by uh, some form of microorganism that can tolerate the toxicity and actually use this, these sort of compounds as carbon sources and of course the PAHs or polyaromatic hydrocarbons of which we have a, a simple example naphthalene and a more complex example benzoapyrene uh, are quite toxic known carcinogens so this is the technique of uh, land farming or bioremediation where we create a, a, a well-contained biopile of soil often in a different place uh, near the contaminated site that's plastic lined and so forth and we add water and nutrients and in this case a surfactant um, to increase the water solubility of these things and uh, you know, maybe increase water penetration into the soil as well uh, and also there was a bit of cultivation from time to time to make sure the system was well oxygenated uh, and so after a reasonable amount of time 161 days so we're looking at, at nearly six months uh, there were significant reductions in the concentrations of a lot of these PAHs in the soil, which is a, a really good thing. Okay, so if we look at the percent reductions, they're probably the most instructive. So for the simple compounds, of which there were more in the soil anyway, we can uh, observe a 98% reduction after that six month period. Less, only about you know, three quarters of the more complex PAHs were degraded during this time. but may not necessarily reflect their complex structure though. We've got a lower substrate concentration and on that basis alone you would expect slower reaction rates. But, but overall the, the PAH content of the soil has decreased by well over 90% simply by relying on the natural soil bacteria or fungi, microorganisms, uh, to degrade that. Notice that, as well, the total number of heterotrophs, this is organisms which need an external carbon source to survive, they don't photosynthesize, actually decreased over the course of the experiment as well. So some of the um, process that was going on was, sel was selection. So there are some organisms which didn't survive with these high concentration of PAHs, uh, but obviously some which did because they were breaking down. Okay just highlighting the reductions and um, noting that we do get a decrease in microbial numbers. A non-biological technique for dealing with organics is soil vapour extraction. So in the case of hydrocarbons, uh, particularly the lower uh, molecular weight, the smaller molecules uh, such as the petroleum hydrocarbons and things like the BTEX group, um, we get uh, and enough of them evaporating that that can be used as a method for remediation and what's often done is that we're either pumping air into the soil and then extracting the air that comes out uh, so that we can treat that and remove the contaminants and what this shows is that the uh, in a situation where this was done uh, in the paper by Lee and co-workers uh, they're getting 
very high concentrations in the extracted gas of, in this case, toluene at the beginning, um, and that decreases asymptotically and reaches about zero um, after a couple of months, really. There's a few spikes later on, but nothing too exciting. And if we look at the cumulative removal of um, toluene in this case, we can see that and over the the extent of the environment, I'm not sure quite sure how big it is, they extracted about just over 100 kilograms of toluene by vapour extraction, which is quite a lot. Uh, that's a good part of a, a drum of uh, organic liquid. And um, that the extraction by philatelization was a large component of that, about 80 kilograms. The rest of the removal was actually by natural biodegradation and in fact they say that the biodegradation process overtakes volatilization at about a month so at about this point here the amount of biodegradation we can see the lines crossing over at the bottom actually is higher than the amount of volatilization so you probably don't want to do this uh, pumping air in for too long um, you can then subsequently rely on the natural processes to take over. That's, that's what the toluene molecule looks like. So it's a, a natural part of, of the petrol you put in the car. There's little bits of that and also used as cleaning fluid and so forth. Um, not uncommon to find soils contaminated with it. Okay, one of the other methods is solidifying soil. So we, we basically make the contaminants unable to leach because we create a, a rock-like material out of the soil. In this case, it's uh, because the soil has been extracted, mixed with some cement and a fly ash from coal combustion, and uh, put back, usually buried uh, at some depth in the soil. In this case, some of the metal contents in the original material, the solidified material, which is shown in the photo at left here, uh, from a core sample, so it looks a bit like concrete, which you'd expect because it's being mixed with cement. Um, very high lead concentrations, pretty high copper and zinc. Uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram cadmium is actually very high for a soil material. Um, and there's nickel in there as well. The important thing is that this, uh, the leaching under standard leaching protocols of these elements was uh, very, very low. Uh, slightly higher value for copper, but the authors uh, stated that guideline values for their application um, for their particular remediation targets were still achieved uh, and that the remediation, the effectiveness of soil solidification in this case lasted quite a long time, about 17 years. Okay. Soil covers, uh, so we, we did need to come to this eventually because I mentioned it at the beginning. Um, so there are a couple of different uh, variations on this. One is to simply add um, soil to the surface and that's what the top half of this table tells us. Um, soil not incorporated so just spread on the surface and there's a control zero centimeters of soil uh, and 10 and 20 and the, the dependent variable in this case what is being monitored is the yield of um, a grass clover um, pasture mixture basically. So in the first season is where we see most of the effect so if we take into account the least significant difference here, we see a significant treatment effect of um, adding some depth of soil. And certainly both of the, the 20 and 10 centimetre depth being significantly greater than the control in terms of allowing the pasture to grow on top. Not so much in the second season where everything seems to be relatively high and similar to what the... Uh, um, the 20 centimetre treatment was in the first year, so maybe there's a bit of self-remediation going on there as well, um, based on just the the previous crop. Okay. The other thing is that we can do with topsoil is actually mix it in and rely on, for example, the organic matter present in the topsoil to adsorb some of the contaminants. But in this case, the the effect of the treatment was quite erratic, um, and it may be that the cultivation to uh, of material mixed in some of the contaminated material to a greater extent so that the more the higher application of clean soil added actually gave a lower yield so that didn't work so well so it seems as though the, based on these results alone anyway that the best thing to do is just to add so the clean material to the surface uh, and that seems to give the best endpoint certainly in terms of plant yield uh, another way of looking at this if I can 
go back to some results that we had a look at before. Um, the other effect in this set of data, of course, is not just liming, which is top versus bottom, but it's, there's topsoil um, added as well. So what topsoil, to a lesser extent than lime, did in this example was to, and this was mixed in with the uh, the mine overburden material, was uh, again to decrease the uptake of cadmium. Um, and there were sig some significant results, not just for cadmium, but for uptake of other metals as well. Uh, and that really relates to the organic matter being present in this case in conserved topsoil from the site. Um, it's often, and this is an, a, a mining situation where uh, the pre-mining the topsoil was removed and stored somewhere so that they could put it back when they'd finished. Uh, and it seemed like that was a worthwhile thing to do because it actually did improve rehabilitation outcomes a bit in terms of the amount of cadmium taken up by plants. Of course, it, uh, this is a pasture. The, the end use of the land in this case was going to go back to agriculture, growing cows basically. So the less cadmium there is in the pasture species, um, the less cadmium the cows are going to eat and then maybe transfer into their products like milk and meat and so forth. Um, and that's a good thing. And it, it turned out that these uh, concentrations of cadmium in the pasture were uh, acceptable in terms of livestock food. So topsoil addition is a good thing to do. It won't solve everything, but it's uh, not a bad idea in itself. Okay. Okay, another effect of soil covers where we're looking at something different from plant uptake. In this case, a, an acid generating material where five different rates and a control of soil uh, were added and uh, this was just not incorporated, so just overlying the contaminated material which was an acidic material. So at the beginning uh, of the experiment we have uh, near neutral pH for everything slightly higher for where the topsoil was added of course uh, and not acidic yet for the uh, potentially acid generating material because it hadn't had time to oxidize yet which it did by the end of the experiment uh, but the addition of topsoil does seem to reduce the expression of that acidity in that uh, overlying clean material uh, and that's a statistically significant effect and the effectiveness of the topsoil wasn't due to some neutralization process in the acid material itself because that stayed acidic. Okay, so this is just below the soil slash uh, contaminated material or spoil boundary. Uh, the pH is still acidic. So the best results achieved with um, more thickness of topsoil. So if we've got a, a mobile contaminant, in this case the contaminant is hydrogen ion giving rise to the low pH, uh, it seems like a greater thickness of topsoil is better. So presumably a metre of topsoil would be better still than, and might retain its original pH. Okay, other soil remediation techniques. I'm sorry, but we don't have time to deal with those. Um, you're going to have to do some research for yourself if you think that for your remediation plan, for your assignment, you need that sort of material. Okay, now briefly got time to talk about groundwater. And so there are a number of different techniques for remediation of contaminated groundwater. Okay, so that's just a reminder that we've, in groundwater, we've got, in terms of organic contaminants at least, a contrast in behaviour between two different types of organics. Some, the, the light, non aqueous phase liquids, so things like uh, oils and, and other hydrocarbons, which are less dense than water hence al napple light non-aqueous phase liquids, uh, which float on top of the groundwater. Um, so they'll sit just above the top of the water table. And the dense non-aqueous phase liquids, uh, which will sink through, so things like chlorinated hydrocarbons and so forth, which are, can be a little bit denser than water. Um, and we'll, we'll also get some dissolved contaminants, um, either from the minimal dissolution of the non-polar liquids, or uh, the dissolved contaminants, maybe things like nitrate and phosphate and metals and things. Now, in, in terms of being able to, to treat this stuff, one of the simplest things to do is just to pump the groundwater out, 
pass it through a some sort of treatment plant, usually after extraction and removal of any contaminated soil, so we're just dealing with the groundwater. And uh, so you pump it through a treatment plant and then pump it back down in hopefully a cleaner state, otherwise there wouldn't be much point, eh? Um, so it, it needs a bit of infrastructure to be built, right? The treatment plant itself, which maybe have to be specific for the particular type of contaminant that's involved. So for example, for an organic contaminant, the, uh, the reactor which removes the contaminant from the groundwater may be something like activated carbon, or for a metal you might use a zeolite or some other uh, cation exchange resin or something like that. Um, so the treatment depends on the type of contaminant, um, and it, you know it's a potentially energy intensive uh, and infrastructure intensive method. But in, in cases of localized groundwater contamination, it may be the uh, the best way to operate. Okay, uh, we can modify the technique slightly with uh, what we call uh, air sparging as well as pump and treat. So we're actually um, pumping out the groundwater at the same time as pumping air down and effectively what we're doing is oxygenating the groundwater and that can both stimulate biological activity which provides a little bit of bioremediation and also in some cases cause uh, other reactions of the contaminants involved. All right, so uh, it can also enhance um, the lateralization given that we have more gas filled pore space down there. All right, so there are some variations on that and look it, it does work these are commercially available techniques by and large for groundwater treatment uh, another interesting and potentially useful groundwater remediation technique is using permeable reactive barriers so these are basically involve quite a bit of site disturbance we dig a trench um, into the path of the groundwater flow down gradient from the source of contamination and into that trench which hopefully extends for the full vertical extent of the groundwater plume, we have some sort of chemical reaction going on. So it's a permeable material, the groundwater just flows through and on the way through it reacts to decontaminate the groundwater. So there may be, uh, for example, for nitrate um, pollution, we may encourage the microbial community, especially the denitrifiers, which would convert nitrate through to gaseous products like uh, dinitrogen gas or, or nitrous oxide gas. So that's, that'd be a way of treating things and often that's that microbial activity is stimulated with something, uh, the example here is vegetable oil, but you can use molasses or um, acetate or something like that, usually something relatively inexpensive. Okay, the other th uh, types of material that can be treated with this of course would be the organics if we stimulate bioremediation processes in here, uh, adding uh, nutrients for example, um, you don't really want to do that in most cases because of the sensitivity of the ecosystem further down, so it's usually for um, inorganic contaminants that this works, although you can put something in the barrier that also absorbs organics. The other thing that uh, has been used successfully for at least in pilot studies is to stimulate sulfate reducing bacteria, so again we add a carbon source um, if we stimulate sulfate reducing bacteria, what that means is that we produce hydrogen sulfide uh, in dissolved form in the groundwater and that can form sulfide precipitates with metals and remove them from the system. All right, and then we have cleaner water going towards our receiving environment. So this is a scenario that looks not too unlike what we have at Centenary Park, but we've got a contaminant source close to a sensitive water body. So again, these sort of things are commercially available techniques in many cases. Uh, and finally, we can pump something into the groundwater, uh, apart from just air, to react with contaminants and uh, degrade them or decompose them. So some of the reagents that are often used would be things like persulfate or hydrogen peroxide, and the idea is that they oxidise organic contaminants. Uh, ideally all the way through to carbon dioxide uh, so that they are uh, a harmless product that then can be removed from the system by degassing or simply exported through the system as bicarbonate or something like that.
All right. So you, you can add different re reagents for different um, different purposes, uh, but most often they're oxidizing reagents such as persulfate or hydrogen peroxide. Okay. So that's groundwater techniques in a nutshell. There, there are many more, uh, but those are the ones that I think it's worth talking about in a, a land remediation unit. Right. So to summarize, there are lots of different rehab and remediation strategies. You know, some of them quite sophisticated, some of them fairly simple, uh, and most of them are probably applicable in one way or another to urban rehabilitation efforts. The strategy that you would choose would reflect uh, a risk-based land management approach. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily go for the fanciest or even most effective techniques. Um, so the decision needs to be supported by good science, of course, but also needs to fit into a socio-economic perspective. Uh, and it needs to be, I guess, at least the minimum that's suitable for the purpose. That is the intended land use after rehabilitation. Okay. So we've got our equation here. Um, so the remediation technique is a function of what type of degradation that we have what our intended land use is going to be after rehabilitation and what is practical in terms of uh, what can be done and what can be afforded. If you want to follow up on any of the things that I've referred to during the lecture, there we have it. And that's where I'll leave it. Mm -hmm.